Hi, uh, thank you for coming to our presentation. And uh, we're gonna speak about our product, Amundsen, a data discovery platform from Lyft. Hi, my name is Shin. I'm an engineer from Lyft. My name is Tao. I'm an engineer at Lyft. Let's see if this is working. Okay. So we're gonna talk about uh, how the data ecosystem looks like uh, in overview at Lyft and the challenges with the data discovery that we have at Lyft and the solution that we provided at Lyft. And then we're gonna have a short demo and give you a high level overview of the architecture and the summary. So in this uh, big data error, almost every employee in the company are actually the user of the data platform. Uh, we categorize as uh, seven user personas that uses the data, data modelers that working on modeling data, data analyst, data scientist, product managers, general managers, engineers, as like me, and experimenters experimenting the data. Here are the users, and here are very uh, simplified overview of uh, Lyft data infrastructure. Uh, from the left, as you can see, uh, there's a smartphone using Lyft app pushing the event, a lot of events, to the server, where the server relays into the message, message platform, which we use Kinesis and Kafka here. And also there's a services directly pushing event as well. And we have a Flink framework that doing streaming processing persists into distributed file system. We use Amazon S3 on this. From there, we have a thou uh, hundreds of Airflow DAGs doing ETL into Amazon Redshift, which is our legacy data warehousing. Hive, backed by Parquet format in S3. And then for a real-time use case, we use uh, Druid, which is real-time database. Once the data lived in uh, this uh, databases, we also have third-party vendors to visualize the data, such as Looker, Mod, Tableau. We also have open source visualization layer, superset, and there are many other custom apps that are consuming this data. This is a very simplified view of a uh, Lyft data ecosystem. But as you can see, it's quite different from like uh, past years where there were only one Oracle database or SQL server. So there's a problem with here that comes with the data discovery, where the data lives, and what does that mean? So let's say you're a newbie data scientist, and you uh, go to your desk, and then you've got the first project that is uh, analyzing and predict the data council attendance. So this is your project. So how do you get this done? So the first thing to figure out is how to predict the data. You need to analyze the past data, right? So the natural question would be, where's the data? And even if you find the data, the probably there are many columns over there. What does it mean? So current solution without any like a uh, provided systemized solution will be like you can email the friend, you can Slack them, uh, probably not a phone these days, but email. Uh, and you can uh, proactively do the search in GitHub or if your company provide code search, you can do the code search on them. And then let's say you find some table, uh, several of them. And that table has like uh, dozens, dozens of fields. And each field mostly does not have like good comments on there. So you lost contacts over there. Like let's say there's attendance field. Does attendance field include employees? Why this is important? Because you probably wanna know, figure out the revenue uh, from that and your employees not including the revenue. So let me dig in to understand more. So the typical way to understand the data here is just to issue the query, like good old fashioned select all from certain partition and you need to sample it because there's so many data over there. The problem with uh, select all is like is it provides lack of productivity because there are a couple of uh, table that you already have, you need to do this. But 
even before that, if you don't have your system set up to do the select all, then you need to do all the uh, connection set up as well as get the permission. Uh, that you waste a lot of time uh, bef before, even before doing the select query. And also it increased load on the databases as, uh, as data scientists population grows in your company. So before we start uh, working on this data discovery uh, solution, we actually did a research on how data scientists are spending their time. Like uh, they're spending on time on their main work analysis, which is one third of them. And then another one third is like waiting for query and do the operation work. Surprisingly, the rest one third, they're spending on data discovery problem basically try to understand what the data is, where it exists, who owns it, who uses it, and how to request the access. So that's why we started building the data discovery solution. And here are the audience that we primarily focus on for our initial launch, which are the analyst and the data scientist, which who are mostly working on full time on data discovery. So we uh, subcategorize uh, three personas on this data analyst and data scientist. Uh, one is power user, who has all the information of data on their hand, probably old timer. Uh, because they have all the information on their head, they got interrupted a lot with a, new, a lot of questions. There are newbie users, especially if your company are growing. There are a lot of new users in your, in your team. Although they are very experienced on the experimenting with the data, they are basically lost in the data discovery world because every company has their own domain knowledge. So they need to ask a lot of questions to their power users. You can easily see there's a friction on here and a lot of productivity being lost because one need to figure out what kind of question to ask who need to, uh, whom, need, whom they need to ask, and power user keep getting interrupted here. Uh, third persona is manager, where they're more likely oversighting their uh, product data pipeline, and they're uh, more concerning on dependencies, and lending on time, and communicating with stakeholders who own the data, who will be affected with the, some certain SLA being missed. So with our solution, we also try to solve three kind of question on this data discovery problem. Uh, the first is uh, quite intuitive, uh, search-based. Uh, if you're looking for, let's say, data council attendance, you just search for that term, and then we're gonna find it for you. Where's the table or dashboard uh, for a certain term? What does it contain? As well as, like, if you're uh, doing, try to do the analysis, if that analysis already exists which means uh, dashboard, for example. Uh, the other solution that we are uh, thinking to provide is lineage-based. Let's say you already searched the data, and now you have a different problem. You are trying to change the data, and who will be affected, and who I should contact, either owner or the most common users that, to discuss how this uh, change can be migrated. Uh, I think the search base and lineage base is quite well known problem, but uh, I think uh, our product is quite uh, uh, exploring this part, uh, network based, and which is like basically if you think of like a Facebook or Twitter, you basically follow some friend or follow some user. We basically uh, try to accommodate that in our data discovery problem. So let's say you're a newbie on the team you probably don't want to look at others' power user's shoulder, right? So basically, we're gonna provide that feature for you. You wanna follow the power user. You can see what, they're, what kind of table they're using, what kind of dashboard they're following. So we're gonna provide that so that we, you can quickly uh, up to speed. So with this, we created a uh, product called Amundsen. Uh, for those people who are not familiar with uh, Munsen, he's the first person to discover the South Pole. 
Uh, he's a Dorigen explorer, and we thought that is quite a, a good match with our uh, discovery product. So this is the first page of uh, Amundsen, and it's quite similar to Google. Like there's a one big text box here, uh, looking for a user to type in their keyword, and we also provide some some like uh, tables in here, popular tables we call it, for the new user to just quickly uh, go in uh, without typing the search. So once you put your search text into the text box and then press enter, we provide you the result. And this is uh, how we compute the search. It's actually not like a isolated to Amazon problem, but it's quite a, a common to search domain. Like there's a two factor in search, and one is relevance, and the other one is popularity. So let's say you search Apple on Google, and you have two data set, Orange and Apple. Which one do you think is more relevant? Uh, probably Apple, right? So let's say you search Apple on Google. You have a two data set, again, Apple as a fruit, Apple.com as a company. Well, which one do you think is more popular? It's Apple.com. That's how uh, Google compute uh, their page ranking uh, to see how many connections they have onto that company. I'm pretty sure there are more complex algorithms over there, but this is the high level idea. So basically, we adopt this idea into our product. So we uh, have a balance of relevance and popularity. So we use a uh, table name, column name, table description, column description, and custom tags to provide relevance. And uh, properly, we basically parsing user SQLs to get the table and column, and also parse the table and column from the dashboard to get the properly, basically, these are enriching our graph. Okay, back to the UI. So once you get this result, let's say you click one of the result, it gives you to the table detail page. On the top left, it gives you the name of the table. Below that, it provides you the availability of the data, which is a partition, a range, if you are more familiar with that word, and also table description, uh, which is editable. Uh, it provides you a list of columns and types with a uh, metadata uh, with a description as well, and uh, which you can also edit as well. On the right side, there are rich set of uh, metadata here, which give you like who owns this table, so that you can ask them what, what kind of data this is, and also you can see like who are the top five frequent users. Frequent user here means that they are the user who are calling this uh, table a lot. Uh, you can ask them a um, question more about like uh, uh, in customers uh, consumer perspective. We also provide some uh, small set of lineage information uh, by providing which application wrote this and the source code location. And this is a better feature here. We also provide a table lineage. We are using some third party, third party vendor that does a table lineage, so we provide a link on that. Uh, we also give you like a preview of the data as well as explore with SQL. We integrate with the superset. So this is a preview, nothing to see that much because everything is redacted here. But uh, basically give you a little bit of feeling, more feeling on the data. Uh, and also we provide the statistics of the each column as well. Uh, basically try to give you more feeling about the data. Uh, one thing, a couple of things that would be helpful would be if the column has null, uh, how many uh, distinctive value it has, it's just to give you more understanding on the data itself. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, we've been launched uh, this product for more than six months and this feature has been very successful on our side because uh, we 
built in uh, the user feedback into our product. It gives uh, user provide rating, bug report, and new feature request. And we continuously getting this and then improve ourselves. Okay, so I will do the quick demo. So uh, because of security reason, I can only search for one table. Uh, you can search for other things as well here. But this is uh, one table. Uh, actually, if you see here, this is an uh, event uh, from the Amazon itself. We are uh, actually logging all the user action so that we can improve. Uh, we basically want to know how users are using our product. So let's say you click this one. Okay, uh, so it show you the table. It show you the partition availability. Uh, there's some description, so you can basically add the description here. And uh, there are columns here. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a statistics here. You can also add it, the description, to give you a better description here. And you can also add owner, frequent users, most are uh, the de developers, because it's our own table, and it, it was able to fetch like which application it brought, table lineage, as well as uh, preview data. And if you click this, it will redirect you to the superset so that you can do the uh, more extensive query over there. Uh, you can add a tag, basically helping you, helping you on the search. And this is the feedback that I mentioned. Uh, last thing is on the bottom, it show you how fresh the Amazon is. So it got uh, refreshed uh, this morning. Okay, so the next part will be the brief introduction of architecture. But to make it more interesting, we built this open source in mind. So if you are interested in collaborating with us, uh, it will be really great. Uh, to, for a high level snippet on the open source, we, we made many parts uh, pluggable so that uh, you can plug like a private code into our services, such as like we are, I mentioned that we are Amazon itself is uh, uh, emitting uh, events. You can inject your event emitter to our code. Uh, we also have using a Python Blueprint, which is you can plug in your API endpoint if you need. And uh, Tao is going to talk about this, but our ingestion engine uh, is like a Lego brick. So you can mix and match like, a, like this is open source. You can add your private transformer, things like that. So. I will hand it over to Tao. Thank you, Jing. So now let me talk about uh, what is the architecture on Amundsen. So Amundsen is a microservice architecture. It consists of three microservices, like the front-end services, a metadata services, a search service, and a data builder ingestion layers. I will talk about each component in more details. First, start with the front-end service. Front-end services is written in React.js and Flask web framework. It's a, used as a portal for user interaction for data discovery. So to recap what Jing is mentioned, he is like a table detail page. At the mock for table detail page, he has a rich variety of uh, metadata, like table names, column names, column descriptions, what, uh, the watermarks for the tables, owners, frequent users, uh, et cetera. All this metadata has been powered by the underneath metadata service. So let's go into what is metadata service. So metadata service is just a sync proxy layer which currently leverage the Neo4j graph database uh, as a backend to power the metadata requests for both front-end services as well as other microservices at Lyft. Currently at Lyft, we use the two microservices using our meta ingesting metadata into our metadata service. One is machine learning feature service, which is used to generate features for training purposes. They ingest like the features related tagging into our metadata for better feature discovery. The other is a secure compliance service, which generates uh, security related tagging for for uh, compliant purposes. So. 
Amundsen start with as a data discovery tool. Now move uh, at Lyft, we move into like more like met metadata engines, which not only for data discovery, it's also used to ingest all the metadata for other services at Lyft. So as mentioned, we use currently ship with Neo4j as default, but we work with some other company to kind of support using Apache Atlas, which is a popular open source project as another option as a graph backend. So when we design the metadata service, there are a couple of trade-offs we have made. The first will be why we choose graph database, not the other. So to recap, why, to answer these questions, so let's recap uh, a bit on the data uh, typical Leaf workflows. So a Leaf mobile client application A, which could find its uh, location into the event B, which could later on uh, consume by our streaming ingest framework C and write to a raw event table D. So, and then later on, there's a, we have a airflow deck, which is a ETL, which are ETL framework, which read this a high raw event table and write to a derived hive table. This derived hive table F could have multiple, have multiple columns. In this case, have five columns like G, H, I, J, K. Out of these five columns, there are three columns have been read and used by a user named L. You could see like this workflow is a, is a, actually is a uh, graph. It's very easy to model with a graph as each component is a, is a vertex and connected them it will be edges. There are other database in, uh, offering in the industry, like one, is, could be, one category could be a NoSQL database like Cassandra and DynamoDB. They do have like performance, uh, good performance, but they don't have good support in join, which is essential to model this uh, relationship. The other will be the traditional RDBMS like Oracle or uh, Postgres. They do have join support, but they don't have, uh, the join performance is not very good once the number of nodes has been increased into certain scale. So in the end, we choose Neo4j as the, our backend, as Neo4j is the most popular uh, graph database. So, here, this diagram is, uh, is the metadata graph which power the ta table, uh, table detail page we just showed. So the central node is the table nodes which have the, all the uh, table metadata. It connect with the column nodes with the has column relationship. It connect with the table description with the has descriptions uh, relationship. Connect watermark node, connect which every deck generate this table, connect which user has been used with this table. And also we have some extended metadata like column statistic, which connect with the columns, so on and so forth. So, so t the second trade-off we have made is like, why not propagate the metadata back to the source? So what does it mean? So before Amundsen is born, like uh, a lot of newbie uh, analysis could ask questions like, should we use this table? Is this column it has been deprecated? Is this column has been used for this kind of purpose? Before Amundsen is born, is a, uh, the domain expert will answer this question in Slack, and then we actually this answer will get lost in a couple of months. After Amundsen is uh, born, we encourage and evangelize those domain experts actually update the table description as well as column description to reflect this kind of uh, domain knowledge. So speaking about uh, this description, the initially generated when user create a GitHub source file, define this table, which run and later on per, this description persists into high meta store and persists into our Neo4j graph. Uh, one question will be, once, use, once this domain expert has updated these descriptions, should we propagate this description back to the source? So first of all, at Lyft, it's very difficult to, it's very, it's very difficult to uh, persist this uh, description, modified description back to the GitHub source file as each GitHub modification require owner check. But should we propagate this uh, modified description back to high meta store? In our initial implementation, actually we did that. So we did propagate back to high meta store, but it's a come with a carrier. It doesn't uh, work with those full rebuild table. Meaning like every time the table is rebuilt, like all this modified description will lost. So at least we have, have about 20% of those, those tables are full rebuilt. So our initial solution just disabled uh, uh, this description editing for those full rebuilt tables. But later on, we heard from our user feedback saying like this full rebuilt table are actually very valuable and still uh, it will be good to support the description modification. 
So in the end, we choose to uh, decide to implement a second version, which treat Amundsen metadata graph as the golden source for description, and then we'll propagate this description back to the source. You only pick up the description for high meta store when the table is uh, newly created. So next, let, let me talk a bit about the search service. Search service is just a, also like meta data service, is a single policy layer using the elastic search to power the search request from front-end services. It supports different search query pattern, like the typical normal search uh, pattern, or category search, as well as wildcard search. Uh, the f let's, let's talk a bit about like, what's the challenge we design here, like how to make the search result more relevant. So to answer these questions, we, we first need to define a search quality metric, which could measure like what kind of optimization we changed our search algorithm, which could help to improve our search quality. At Lyft, we use internal use a metric called click-through rate, or CTR, which is a typical campaign metric, which we use to measure the percentage of people click the top five result. When we do the instrumentations, we found that actually our initial search quality is not very good. For example, some of the user, when they try to search a table, it doesn't end up in a first or second, uh, first or second entry, but it goes to fifth or sixth pages. The other will be users sometimes get empty result, which uh, this come with the second uh, point. Is like because we have a very good instrumentation, it help us to understand all this uh, user behavior. In the end, based on the user feedback as well as this uh, logging we have, we do a couple of improvements. First, when people is searching an exact table main, we boost those uh, search result ranking so that you will come into the top first or top second result. And we also support wildcard search. So some of our table are very, have a very long name. We support wildcard search, allow user to kind of see, uh, search those uh, table, even uh, assuming they don't have typo. And also we support category search. For example, in this case, we want to search all the table with certain specific column. Like in this case, we, I want to search all the tables with column is underscore line right. So fourth, data builder. So data builder is our ingestion layer to pull the, all the, uh, pull the metadata from the source and persist into our graph. It comes with a different challenge when we're building this. Like first, is at Lyft, we have many different forms of metadata. So as shown before, we have like many data, uh, databases like Redshift, Hive, uh, as well as FODAC, OLAP Druid, Postgres, as well as Presto View. We also use many dashboard tools like Superset, Mo, Tableau. All these different uh, metadata doesn't have a single standardization, meaning doesn't have, uh, is no single data model that could fit for all the data source. The second is that they, they all use different extraction pattern. Uh, some use the DB API to fetch, some use some external API to fetch, like Mo dashboard. Some are using like uh, GitHub to fetch a source code. So second challenge is like pull model versus push model. So what does it mean? Pull, pull model means wherever the uh, upstream source or database has any change, we don't fetch this metadata instantaneous or in near real time, but we fetch in a, a leverage uh, some ETL framework to fetch this updated metadata in a fixed schedule and persist into our data graph. Push model mean if there's any change in the upstream source, this upstream source or database will send an additional event into our messaging queue, which will be uh, consumed by our near real time framework into our graph. So the plus side of a pool model is when you, it's not easy to define a single, uh, single data model, a single interface for all the metadata. Or it's also good if you don't need a real, near real time support. But the, but the downside will be once this metadata consumption has been grown with many organizations or many different teams, it's hard to scale because it's not easy to write a data ingestion crawler for each of these metadata source. Push model is good if you could define a single interface to model all this metadata change. And you also have real-time effects so that people could see the metadata change instantaneously. At Lyft, we start with using the pool model because at that time, when we start building Amundsen, our Kafka's infrastructure has 
just bootstrap is not that reliable. Now uh, we are moving to a hybrid model, meaning like we combine and leverage both pull model as well as pull push model. So this is what act, uh, actual data builders looks like. It's a con it's a, this data builder framework is highly inspired by the a popular data integration framework named Apache Goblin. It consists of four phases, like extractor, transformer, uh, loader, and publisher. Here is an example. Like here, uh, uh, this example shown like we pull the metadata from high meta store and persist into our Neo4j graph. It used first a high table metadata extractor, which extract the record from high meta store and put uh, transfer into the no op no op transformer. And then this no op transformer, because we don't need to do any transformation in this case, we pass to the file system Neo4j CSV load, uh, loader to load it into a staging area as a serialized CSV files. And then later on, used by the Neo4j CSV publisher to publish the, uh, this change into our Neo4j graph. As Jing mentioned, it's, it's like a Lego block. You could use like either our open source uh, um, extractor or the transformer, or you could have your own private private version. So this is shown as an example, which is very simple. You just plug and play, use whichever you want, and then put some, some kind of config to define, and then that's it. So at Lyft, we use Apache Airflow, which is a popular workflow uh, orchestration framework to orchestrate this data builder job. And we want like this data builder or metadata job to run in certain sequence. We want the table metadata to, to kick off first to generate all the related table metadata. Once that is finished, then generate all the extend metadata, like what's the high watermark, low watermark for this table, what's the table statistic, which deck has generated this table, so on and so forth. And after everything is finished, we, we run our last uh, job or last task in FO term, which is called last updated times, uh, generate the last updated timestamp to show the data freshness of our metadata graph. So what's next? So Amundsen seems to be more useful than we thought. So at Lyft, we have been used by many different personas. Like even customer service has been used our tool. So we, we think many organizations have similar problems, so we, we are currently collaborating with some external company, and we plan to announce the open source very soon. So talking about the impacts, so this is a weekly active user of our Amazon usage at Lyft. We call it the MBA graph because it only has X axis, but it doesn't come with the Y axis. So when we initial launch, we come to alpha phases, alpha release is only available with certain users. Once we adopt the user feedback and do some improvement, we move on to the beta release, which is internal release, which show us a huge jump. Once that is a beta release, we do a lot of improvement into uh, improve our observability, improve our reliability of our tool, and also setting up the page for our, uh, our tooling, and then move on to GA. And then you could see a huge jump. Then we see a huge dip because it's a Christmas. No one is working at Lyft at that time, so no one is using our tool. So once everyone is back, we see our tool has been steadily, uh, uh, user has been steadily growing. So in summary, so what's next? So currently, we've, we finish adding a table as the first data set into our resource. We plan, we currently actively working on adding like dashboard as well people into our data resource. We want to like show some of the uh, heavily used dashboard uh, and showcase, uh, allow user to discover, as well as showing what a data domain expert, what table they are used the most, which table they own. Once that is finished, we also want to add like Kafka stream as well as the IDL schema as well as ML workflow into our, into our graph. So in summary, we found like a good data discovery tool like could add 30% more productivity to our data scientists. And we believe metadata is the key to our next uh, gen big data application. And Amundsen is the, our live in uh, produced like metadata data discovery platform. 
we have a blog post uh, with this goal link, and we also have a recently did an interview with the software engineer daily about about our tool in more detail. You could check. Uh, it just released yesterday. You could check out as well. So uh, thank you. Hi, uh, <clears throat> just quick question. If you're authoring a workflow, how much work do you need to do to plug into this system? So I author an Airflow job, I produce some Parquet files somewhere. How do I plug data into the metadata system that you can't extract from the Hive Metastore or something to, so you can surface all this metadata? So uh, to clarify your question, do you want to plug in your Airflow DAC information into Amazon? Is that what yeah, you are? I want to be able to connect the data asset to the Airflow task or operator that produced it. That was in the UI. So, so each of this uh, data builder job, which generates one single metadata, is a. Uh, if you're familiar with Airflow, it will be just a Python operator job in at Lyft. In this case, you just write a Python function and call the data, uh, call the data builder library function. Yeah. Hi. Um, so when you were showing the the process of data builder and the metadata extractors. Um, did the Hive Metastore extractor, does that come out of the box with Edmondson? Sorry, what's the last part? Does the, the Hive metadata extractor come with Edmondson? Yes, yeah, so it's part of the open source. Okay. Uh, because uh, it's basically talking with a MySQL instance of a Hive Metastore. Uh, that's uh, pretty de well defined, so we embed it into our open source. Uh, does that mean there's other, uh, just the last question, does that mean that there's other uh, metadata extractors that come with Edmondson that aren't the Hive one currently? Uh, mostly we support Hive uh, as a table resource, uh, but you can easily come up with, so on the bottom, you, you can see the SQL Alchemy extractor. So basically it supports like Postgres Redshift. So if you just know the query to how to get the information out of those database, you can easily plug in.